a fish hobbyist all my life, I've been in many discussions about central sumps, whether or not they're good for a hobbyist fish room, and I've always heard that they were not. Because, for instance, you know, if you get a disease in one tank, then suddenly it's in all the tanks. And you have water, a central sump being a separate container, that the tanks drain down into, and the water's pumped back up into the tanks after being filtered. Um, you know, if the power goes out, then the sump overflows, and then you have a flood, and it's a terrible thing. So uh, it's usually been considered that central sumps were, were not good for the, the hobbyist fish room. And then I started Select Aquatics, and I wanted to make sure that all the fish that I shipped out to people, that the fish had to make as little acclimation from my tanks to your tanks as possible. So, for instance, I knew this guy out in California, and he had these angelfish that he insisted were, were the size of coffee saucers. And the reason he got his angels so big was he used RO water and he did all kinds of things to them in their water that produced really large, healthy fish. But then they never lasted more than a couple of weeks when they got to customers' tanks because there were so many things he was doing to his water to make the fish look like that. Um, I wanted not to do any of that. I wanted to make sure that when you receive fish from me that, that they'd be kept very as similar as to what I'm doing here that's what you will do, and so that they'll adjust. So I didn't use things like central sumps or, or ultraviolet sterilizers, or um, I don't use any chemical additives, etc., to my tanks. So uh, anyway, so the Select Quacks built out, and I started finding myself having to bleed, breed more and more plecos. Plecos are really big on water quality, and um, so I my egg production has not been what it should have been and it never has been i mean there's been times when i had i used to have always at least a thousand green dragons here at one time and then they became very popular and now it's all i can do to keep my numbers up so now in particular i'm i'm focusing on trying to increase my egg production and so water quality is really big with the plecos well i learned something someone pointed out to me that if you have like say four 20 gallon tanks and uh, they then are uh, working independently. The fish in each of those tanks, uh, based on the water quality swings, uh, as a result of organic materials coming in and out of the tank, water changes, etc., etc., every fish feels like it's in a 20 gallon tank. So if you take those four tanks and you run them down into a sump where the water is being filtered and then pumped back up into the tanks again, the fish then go from feeling like they're in a 20 gallon tank to feeling like they're in an 80 gallon tank. And so now you have four consistent tanks, basically one big 80 gallon tank divided up into four sections um, that is now going on. And the fish feel much more comfortable and you see the, uh, the, the, the size difference, you see the, the appetite change and everything else that happens uh, when you take those fish and put them into a larger tank. So central sumps had, had, had benefits. And so um, I also saw an increase in egg production with the plecos. So now I have three central sumps here in the room. And this video coming up is going to be about uh, the addition of a fourth central sump, which is now with the, the most powerful motor that I've put in, pump that I've put into the room up to this point. Now the thing about central sumps is, for me, is not just filtration and water quality. The other big thing with, with central sumps is people write me all the time about, you know, how do you breed the green dragons? How do you get the egg production? What do you do to your water to make them, what are the spawning triggers? You know, what are you doing to the water or to the conditions to make them want to spawn? Well, everything I do is going to be in this video. And we'll show you how, how I'm, how I'm uh, uh, putting in a central sump. But the thing about the central sump is that this is being added to a fish room that already has an automatic water change system. So now I have a situation where I can manipulate between the two, uh, the, the daily water changes and the central sump ongoing, cutting one out, increasing one, cutting one down, increasing it, lowering, whatever, back and forth, to find the combinations that, that cause the plecos to spawn. Um, not only plecos, but of course many other fish in the room. And the reason that I'm doing this is not just for the green dragons, but it's primarily for the Pacelia vellifera, which I really want to get their numbers up, and also the Zephophorus montezuma. So this sump that we're putting in now is going to be for 10 tanks, and the tanks are primarily going to go over to uh, uh, the vellifera and the Montezumas, but because of the way this is being set up, 
uh, it, it's going to also increase the filtration to all my Pleco breeder tanks. So I'm going to see benefits from those three species primarily um, uh, by the addition of this. So anyway, a lot of work went into this video. I hope you enjoy it. Um, uh, if you've got any questions or concerns, certainly send me an email at uh, selectaquatics at gmail.com and I'd love to talk to you more about it. Take care. Bye-bye. So what we are going to do is in our fish room, these four tanks will represent our fish room, is to put a sump, a large container that will work as an external filter, onto our tanks so that will substantially boost the filtration uh, for our four tanks. The sump will then have fill and drain lines going into each aquarium that it services. This would be interesting enough, except that in this fish room we have a problem. With our four tanks, we already have an automatic water change system in place that's changing 15% of the water every day. The water change system already has fill and drain lines going to each aquarium, mounted on the back of each aquarium, and you cannot add water to the tanks that are using the external sump, or the sump will overflow when you do a water change. Though not always successful, I try to keep water on the floor here to a minimum. <laughs> also, the drains already in place to do the water changes are not big enough to handle the flow of water that will be coming from the sump, so we'll need to leave them alone and add new drains to handle the greater flow of water. This means that the new siphons for the sump we are putting in will need to be hung on the front of the tanks, which is far from ideal as they obstruct the view into the tanks, and I agree they'll look like crap, but these tanks are meant to, grow, uh, to be grow-out tanks for fish requiring higher levels of filtration, and I'm not left with any other alternatives. But if you were to do this, the second set of siphons could certainly be mounted on another side of the tank or placed where they wouldn't obstruct the view into the tank. But I need to do it this way because of how the tanks are arranged on the stands that they're sitting on. So the way I have chosen to do this, and that has worked well for three other central sumps being operated here along with the automatic water change system, is to operate them as an entirely different system. The sump is turned off entirely when the water change is being done. I generally do the daily water changes by doing it manually at the controllers anyway, so I've been able to turn off the sump, do the water changes, and then start the sump back up again when the water change is completed. I do this every day and this will be the fourth of this type of sump in my room. These X's represent valves that were put in so I can turn off and isolate the sump system from the water change system when the water changes are being done. There's three valves and a power switch. The power switch is simply attached to the power cord of the pump so that it can be turned on and off easily. Plugging the pump into a power strip that can be mounted onto the stand and can be turned on and off would do the same thing. The first valve would be on the line going to the, to the pump so that any water draining down from the tanks above will go into the main drain line and not into the sump, just like the drain line going into the sump. So a valve is put there as well and turned off when the water change is being done. The third valve will be on the main drain line going out to the city so the tanks will drain into the main drain line when the water change is going on. When the water change is done, then that valve is turned and the main water line is, is cut off and the sump area tanks are isolated from the other system. Lastly, so that a water change can be done automatically when I'm not home, a valve on the fill line totally closes off the sump system from the water change system. This way, when a water change is done automatically, the valves on the drain and the fill lines will be turned off and the tanks on the sump will not be affected. Essentially then, when the sump is running to do a water change, you simply follow a series of steps that become second nature over time. What I do is first open up the main drain line, then close off the valve to the drain into the sump. Then I let the pump push the water out of the sump, and when that is done, I turn off the pump and close the valve on the line coming from the pump going into the tanks. Then I do the water change, and when done, I fill the sump back up with a hose with dechlorinated water, close off the main drain line to the city, reopen the other valves, and turn the pump back on. The water level will settle a bit as the tanks fill, and you will want to watch the sump as the pump pushes the water up into the tanks to get the level in the sump to maintain where the water level consistently stays at about two inches above the pump. And that's it. 
Okay, so this might seem like a really dumb question, but how do you get the water from the pump sitting in the sump up into your tanks uh, with as little, with as few problems as possible? You want to avoid a situation that I've had happen where you're sitting in your fish room and you know you get everything hooked up and you plug the sucker in and, you, and, and you're ready to go and then all of a sudden you're witnessing something that you have to pause because you're thinking I've never seen anything like this before and I hope to never see anything like this again as a fire hose of water is shooting say up into the ceiling of your fish room or across the fish room. Um, I've had that happen to me twice and so there is a way to avoid having that happen. And you want to do a couple of these steps that I've learned the hard way uh, that I'm going to share with you to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. So this pump right here is a very powerful pump. Um, most of the little pumps that you put on your filters on your aquariums, a good strong filter, a good strong pump for uh, one of your hang on the back filters is going to be about 250 gallons per hour. This pump here is 2700 gallons an hour. So this has more than enough power to create that fire hose effect I was just talking about. So we want to make sure that nothing like that ever happens to us. So you get the pump. The pump is going to come with an adapter. Um, not all of them do, most of them do. This pump has a one and a half inch uh, out here, threaded outlet, but it does give you an adapter that allows you to downsize to uh, one inch and then to have a hose going for a three quarter inch. So we're going to go ahead and put that in because we're going to go ahead and use a main line going uh, out to the tanks that is one inch. And then from that one inch line will be three quarter inch lines, fill lines, that will fill the tanks. So we'll go ahead and put this guy on. Then you hit your, home, uh, your trusty Home Depot, where everybody knows me, <laughs> better or worse. <laughs> um, and you pick up a little uh, connector, which is threaded. And so this is going to go ahead and fit on the threads that are provided on the pump. Now, yeah, we want everything to be uh, um, uh, uh, non-threaded, So, because I'm using all this PVC that does not have threads. So we want to get another adapter that allows for a threaded uh, section to go into the connector, but then leave you with a smooth section where you can put PVC into that, into the, into the, uh, uh, up into the tanks from here. So we'll screw that sucker in. Now, when I'm putting these things together, I don't use Teflon tape, I don't use glue. These kinds of things, are you're going to want them to come apart uh, easily so you can do maintenance on the pump and take care of it. Um, and also, it's going to be sitting down in the water in the pump, so if there is a little bit of leaking coming out of your threads, you're, it's not really an issue. Um, so, when you cut PVC, so we can get a piece here that's a good example. If you cut it to an inch and a half, that will that is the right length where when you put it in to a section and you put another one on top of it it will cause the sections to be uh, snug against one another and that's what you want so the next thing we're going to put on is we'll put our little bit of uh, one and a half inch pvc here and then this sucker is going to go in here nice and snug against that and this is an overflow this is extremely important. Um, this way you can adjust the amount of power from the pump going up to your tanks. I may not need 2,700 gallons of power um, to, to go up and to, to hit all the tanks and do the water changes I need. So this allows me to flow off uh, any excess. Um, and so when you're first plugging it in, you want to make sure this is open because then what happens is the pump will just pump it out and it goes on into the rest of the other section of the sump. It's set up like this and its height is like this is because when measured the divider in the sump fits right here. So this is going to fit right on top, sitting on top of the divider and this is going to go over to the floss section of the pump and run the overflow back through the floss. Okay. After that we're going to need to put one of these guys on. The reason for this is that this valve when we're doing uh, water changes and we turn the pump off and we drain the tanks down a little bit and we empty the sump out to change the water, we don't want water from the tanks draining back down into the sump while that's going on, overflowing the sump and causing problems. So we put this on and then when we turn this, it's going to prevent any water coming into the sump from the tanks above. So when we're doing any maintenance or doing anything where the sump is for any reason turned off, 
you want to have this here so that you can turn the water coming up from the uh, from the tanks so that it doesn't drain down, drain down into the sump and overflow the sump when the pump is not running. Then we're going to want to put on lastly this on top of that, and this is a coupler that will allow you. <coughs> To, by taking that off, then you can lift this out of the sump and do any maintenance or any care on the pump very easily. This then, of course, this piece here then, of course, goes off up to the tanks. Now, I, as I mentioned, I don't glue or use Teflon on the threaded sections. However, every other section in this system has to be glued. So each of these joints is going to be is going to be glued because you don't want to have there's going to be a bit of pressure in here and you don't want to ever have a situation where the pressure, you know, will will push something uh, off and cause you to have a disaster. So this is what you need to do. And so when you first plug the the, the pump in, um, you have this wide open so that no water is going to go up into the into the tanks. And then you can gradually turn this back and then watch as your tanks begin to, to fill as the water goes up into the tanks and see how much of the power from the pump you actually need. You may be able to use the, the all the power from the pump and then you would have it entirely off. But when you first set it up and get it going, you want it wide open so that you don't have any, uh, any potential for having water I'm going somewhere where you don't want it to go. So with this system like this, I'm going to go ahead and glue this and we'll be ready to put this into the sump and this will be uh, uh, ready to go to start our system. So when you're in a situation where you're putting a lot of water into a tank, you have to come up with a way to get a lot of water out of the tank. Otherwise, of course, the tank's going to overflow. So you want to work something out that uh, gets the water out of the tank comfortably and as easily as possible and what most people will do is they'll drill a, a hole in the side of the tank and have a bulkhead sitting over the over the glass that drains down into a sump. My experience has been that you go out and you buy the diamond drill that's going to make the hole inside of the tank and then you break four or five tanks uh, while you get your, your technique dialed in. Hopefully you don't get a, a tank made of shatterproof glass where you touch it with the diamond drill and the whole glass shatters. And then when you get your technique dialed in and you finally get some tanks going where the, the bulkhead is established correctly and all of that, you put them on the wooden stands. Wooden stands tend to flex and, and, and grow and, and change over time due to the humidity in a fish room. And the bulkhead against that glass will end up developing pressures and tensions over time as the, uh, as the, st as the uh, aquarium stand and the tanks on them settle in over time and you'll end up cracking the glass that the bulkhead is fit on. Plus, uh, you, let's say you want to take a tank out or you want to replace it or you want to make a change, uh, doing so with drilled tanks with bulkheads is not an easy thing to do. And, uh, so, this, so I discovered this PVC means of, of uh, draining the tanks down and uh, it, I put it together over time in bits and pieces and trying to figure things out over the years. But I've had customers since send me uh, articles from uh, Innes in the 1930s who had been using this external loop uh, PVC drain system. I believe he called it an external loop automatic water leveling system. And so uh, th that uh, three quarter inch uh, PVC drain, uh, drain setups that I've been using have worked great for the last oh goodness, at least 15 years. And how to build them and how to set them up is described very thoroughly in the uh, Select Aquatics video on building your own automatic water change system. But with this thing where we're going to have a very powerful pump pumping a lot of water into the tanks, the standard single three-quarter inch auto, uh, external loop uh, uh, drain is not going to work very well. It just isn't going to keep up. So about five years ago, um, I realized that I had this, same, this, this problem of needing to get more water out of the tank at a time and I came up with a double uh, PVC system that looks like this and it works really well 
and it actually is not difficult to start and if one of the siphons goes it's actually very easy uh, to address and fix and in my room where I'm constantly swapping tanks in and out you know you look at a, at, a, at a rack and you say gee I wish I had a 30 there instead of those two tens then with this system you just go ahead pull the PVC off pull the tank out put the new tank in put another piece of PVC on and then you're all ready to go and you're not dealing with uh, any of the issues you deal with when you're dealing with drilled tanks. So anyway, the way this works is that uh, uh, you have your two PVC drains here. These, of course, fit, fit into the tank. These are your catch issues. And then this here allows you to look in and see whether the drains are both working. For instance, you can look in when it is running, and if water is running down through here, then you know that this one is working. And then you can do it the opposite and you can check and see and that tells you which drain might not be working and if you happen to have to start it again uh, then all you need to do is uh, open up the one that is is faulty cover over the little hole on the top there close this off and then start the siphon like any regular uh, siphon would be with a siphon starter uh, as described in the automatic water change video um, I'll go ahead and film a little section on one of these that's currently working in the fish room so you can see what it looks like. But these work great and uh, very rarely, if ever, lose their siphon. Um, the only time I do run into situations where I lose a siphon is if I happen to work on the tank and I drain it down too low or if I put something in the tank like a box filter, which I have a lot of, and the bubbles get up into, into, the, into, the, into the catches, into the drains. Uh, then it's going to stop the siphon. But otherwise, if left alone, it should work trouble-free for, for years. Now the fill lines that go into the tanks, you have, to, you have to think about it a little bit. You're going to have a valve down here so you can adjust what the flow rate into each tank is going to be. And the only issue to be mentioned here is that I normally used a 1 16th inch hole for my standard water change system. But with this being a little bit more uh, powerful, and with dealing with larger amounts of water, and because I have a, 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 a valve, a ball valve below that's going to adjust the amount of water going through anyway, uh, then I use a one quarter inch drill to go through here. Three sixteenths might also work as well. Whether that quarter inch is going to work or not, to be honest, as I'm filming this, I don't know because I haven't turned this thing on yet, but I expect that it will be fine. You definitely want some type of a cap with a hole drill, uh, drilled into it because that gives you far greater control over the flow of the water going into each of the tanks. So here are two of the double siphons that have been working on this 75 gallon now for about four years. They rarely lose their siphon. Uh, it's only happened a couple times. Whenever it does happen, it's my own fault. It's usually because I place the box filter there too close to one of these uplift tubes and air gets into them and it stops the siphon. Otherwise, they don't generally ever stop. But let's say you want to, your water level appears to be going up or you're concerned that it might have stopped. Then all you do is turn off one of the siphons, say turn off this one, then reach in here, look inside, and you can see the water running down. And if, uh, if the water is running fine, then you know that this one's working when it's open. Then go ahead, reopen this one back up, and close this one, and look again and see. And if the water is not running, then you know that that's the valve that, that isn't working. So whenever I'm going to uh, go ahead and do one of these kinds of projects, um, I don't let myself get stressed out about it. Um, it's just like working with Legos or uh, an erector set or a tinker toys or whatever, where you're simply, you've got like four variables. Um, you simply have these little T's, connectors, 90 degree angles, and knobs and of course lengths of PVC. And PVC is cheap. Uh, a 10 foot piece of uh, uh, half inch PVC is only between three and four dollars. So PVC is very cheap. So what I do is I just have fun with it and I enjoy building it. And uh, of course you're going to need a tape measure. And you're going to need a PVC cutter. There are two types. Um, if you get a chance, or a choice, this is definitely much better than this is. Um, I used these for years, but when they came out with this style, this is much better. These cost about twice as much, but uh, they last longer and uh, they make a better cut and all kinds of things. So 
Uh, but these do work if you, if you have to have it. Yeah, nice pair of PVC cutters. And go ahead and you know, measure out about where you're going you know, with, your, with your sections, how you're going to lay things out. When you go ahead then and put it together to test and it's not, you know, maybe it's a little too long, fine, just cut it back. If it's not long enough, set that piece aside and get another piece out. Um, if you have to cut up a piece and you don't use it at all, it's only PVC, it's cheap. Um, you know, you, you want to get it totally settled in and comfortable so you don't have tension in it. So it's pulling against itself or, or you have spots where you have any areas where there's any pressure built up. You want it just to have to lay it, have it lay real nice and easily over the tanks and you're going to be building two lines, a drain line and a fill line. So for instance here we have the drain line which is a one inch line and here we have the fill line which is a half inch line. When I first built this particular uh, setup, this is not the one we're working on for this video, the half inch line was more than enough for my fills. But now um, I realize my flow is very compromised in part because the pumps have been building up in strength over time and now I have a much more powerful pump than I had initially. So the next project here is actually to redo this one and put in one inch lines down here going to a three quarter inch fill line. But that's the next project after this is something we're working on is done. So anyway, you put the whole thing together and then you lay that. Don't touch the glue. <laughs> Don't go near the glue. Leave the glue alone. Um, the reason is because once it's all done, and make it pretty, you know, have fun with it, make it look elegant, you know. And I'll, uh, another thing I'll use when I'm putting these together is uh, another very standard big tool in a fish room, electrical ties. So when you're doing it in pieces and things are not quite being held up yet in various spots, you can use electrical ties to hold things together uh, and then so you can you know, get it all locked up correctly. And then when that's done, like again, no glue, then everything has to be taken down and taken all apart and then glued once you know that all the measurements are correct and then put back together again. Now, for those of you who are thinking, oh my God, that's too much work. You know, I mean, you've got to build it initially, then you've got to take it apart entirely and take it all down again and then re-glue everything and put it back together. Well, actually, I filmed myself doing it in just two minutes. So uh, that's following this. Enjoy. concern with any type of external filter, particularly a sump that is not fully enclosed, is getting water on the floor when the power goes out, and this is actually solved fairly easily. What I have done with the other sumps here is to run a 3 inch tube of PVC to the nearest drain, coming out the back of the sump just above the level of the filter material. Hopefully you'll never need it, but if you do, 
Any excess water quietly flows to the nearest drain, or in this case, the basement sump, where it is then pumped out into the garden. On my other sumps, I have needed it, but always due to human error. I'm filling up the sump with a hose after a water change and then get distracted, those types of things. Once done, you'll want to test it by deliberately turning off the power when it's running, standing back and then seeing what happens. To cut a three inch hole into a black piece of plastic, what I did was cut a ring from a three inch PVC tube that I'll be using and using the white or black PVC doesn't matter. But if you have a choice, I can say that the white doesn't smell nearly as bad when you cut it and I find it a little easier to work with. Anyway, to make a circle that I could see, I put a little of the white caulk that I'll be using around the exterior of this ring that I had cut and then when I pulled it away, I could see where to cut the sump to put the piece of PVC into it. And then I used my Dremel tool and I cut it easily. Then I used a one and a half inch section of PVC, put a collar on one side, put it through the hole, put a collar on the other side, and then glued that in to hold the PVC onto the side of the sump. And that is then thoroughly caulked in with a waterproof sealant. Then of course, I let it dry for at least two days before I go ahead and use it. That collar is then connected to 90 degree elbows and run back to the point where the water is drained. So since the last time I, I saw you here, I went ahead and closed off the drains to all of the uh, automatic water chain system drains and uh, filled up all the tanks to the top so that now we can go ahead and uh, get these guys started, all of these uh, uh, double siphons started. I was going to show you how to do it. It's actually quite simple, not a big deal at all. What you're looking to do is you're creating a straight shot from the uh, from the the, the, uh, the capture end of the tube here, going straight up, it's going to come out and down. So you want to do one at a time. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at this one first. And when it's working, the water level you'll see is right here right now. The water level will drain down to right about here, and uh, and then the, uh, the the drain will keep the water level in the tank as close as it's capable to that spot. So we're going to go ahead and start this one. This one off. Then because we want to go ahead and, and, and use this here to pull water through, not to pull air through, turn this off. <coughs> so now, we're just going to go ahead and pull air through here, and it's going to start this for a cycle. Now when we're doing it, there's one more thing to remember. On the top here is a cap, and then the cap has a hole. This hole allows the water to stay at a certain level, so that it doesn't just drain and siphon out all the time so that the water level will stop when it hits this point. So this is a little hole here. So you want to make sure you cover that with your finger. You pull it through. Okay, so now the siphon is started. You can open this guy up. Take this off. And if you, you, can, you can hear and you can see the water running down this inside there so you know the siphon is going. So, <clears throat> that one's working. So what we want to do we're going to turn it off, turn the other one on, and then do the same thing with it. And you can hear it running, and uh, you can see it running down through that. We'll close this off. Open that up, and now both siphons on that tank are running. And that's how it is. That's how it goes. Simple as it is. So I'll go ahead now and get started and get the siphon started and all the rest of the tanks. So we're going to fire this up and see how it does. So there's a couple things you have to do. The siphons have been primed and are ready to go. The valve down here to the main line has been turned off, so the sump is now closed off from the rest of the system and the valve attached to the pump on the line that comes down from the tanks is turned on so the pump can move the water up into the tanks. These two drain lines are turned on, the sump water level is brought up to just above the top of the brick in the sump and we have the trusty fish room hose ready for when the pump is turned on. The water will be pushed up into the tanks lowering the water in the sump so we'll need to keep water going into the sump with the hose to keep the water level up until it balances out with the water level settling in the sump to where it stays right at the top of the brick. And then we have the sodium thiosulfate mix to dechlorinate the water that we're adding to the sump. 
I just glug a little bit into it, knowing that a little bit too much is, isn't going to do any harm. So I'll go ahead and plug in the pump and see how it does. Okay, the pump is on, and most of the fill lines seem to be working right away. One thing I have done is, when you look down at the fill lines into the tanks closest to the pump, they're turned almost entirely off. This first one is only open about 10 to 15 percent, and the next tank over is adjusted similarly. The reason is that the flow to the tanks nearest the pump will receive all the water if they're not more restricted than the other tanks down the line. So you want to leave the valves more open on the far away tanks, and have them close down as you get closer to the pump. The job then becomes keeping an eye on each tank and how each is filling, and then adjusting the flow going into the tanks as necessary. So we'll check back here in a few minutes and adjust the valves so the water level in each tank is roughly even between tanks and is staying stable and consistent. An important point I should have mentioned earlier is that you want to have the overflow bleeder line wide open when you first turn the sump on. Then you slowly turn the valve off to push water up into the tanks, which I've already done here and I still have a little overflow going on. When you first turn the pump on, you want to make sure that this overflow valve is wide open to prevent the potential for water going somewhere it shouldn't. Then when you slowly close it down, pushing more water up into the tanks, if there are any joints that didn't get glued or there's any weak areas that need to be addressed, you'll be able to spot them at that time before the full water pressure is put through the system. I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but this particular fill line is going to a 55 gallon tank that's the furthest tank from the pump. So when I'm trying to determine whether the overflow at the pump is adjusted correctly, whether I need to have more overflow going or less, I will go to the furthest away fill line, open it up full bore, and if the amount coming out is adequate, not too weak or too strong, then I know that the amount of bleed that I'm letting flow from the overflow valve is correct. If it's too strong, I would open up the bleed a little to let more out. If it was too weak, I would close off the bleed line or dial back other tanks nearby so that water gets into this tank. That's how I determine if the adjustment to the amount of overflow is correct. Everything is running, everything is looking as it should, and the supply to these 55s at the ends is also good. The sump water level is staying even at the top of the brick. The water levels throughout the tank seem to be staying at a good height and are stable. The next thing I need to do, now that the valves are set where they're going to stay for a while, and everything is stable, is you'll notice that on many of these tanks I have a piece of electrical tape set on each tank. This tells me where the water level was maintained on this tank with the automatic water chain system. As more water is now going into the tank, the water level is going to be a little higher, and I'll put a new piece of tape on each tank to show where the water level should be with this new sump. This way I can tell if the water level is going up and there may be a problem with the siphons, or if the water level is going down and there may be an issue with the pump. Those pieces of tape will be on every tank, and then each day when you first come down to the fish room, a brief glance can tell you if there's something that you need to take a look at. This way you can tell when your siphons are starting to clog, or the impeller on your pump may need to be cleaned. Here's a tank of short fin green dragons that are really going to appreciate their step up in water quality. Now I should mention, for those of you who have been wondering how I'm going to get into these tanks, trust me, <laughs> I've been thinking the same thing. I can cut a section away, as you can see I've already done here and we'll cut out sections over these other tanks as well to provide light and access into the tanks from above. Here is one of the fish that this system was built for and you can see that they certainly like the flow of water going into the tank. Kind of makes all the effort worthwhile. Here are the tanks on this new system a week later, and you can see that I was able to open up the tops to provide access into the tanks and allow for light to be placed overhead. With a 2700 gallon per hour pump, the head pressure on this setup reduces the output to likely no more than about 1900 gallons per hour. With 8 to 29 gallon tanks and two 55 gallon tanks, this pump is then servicing 342 gallons. At 1900 gallons per hour, that works out 
to an average of each tank being turned over about 5.5 times per hour. Thank you for watching this video on building the central sump and, and uh, a little bit more about the Select Aquatics Fish Room. Um, by this point, you probably think I'm out of my mind. Um, and I didn't put this out because I really expect anybody to go out and duplicate what I did. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't necessarily, uh, necessarily recommend it either. But it works um, and uh, it gives you all the ideas and all the basics on what a central sump is, how to hook it up, how to put it together, um, and some of the benefits that can be gained. Um, I imagine that some of you out there are sitting down with a pencil and paper and can probably figure out a better way to get a daily water change system to articulate with a uh, sump system in such a way that the changes and the things I have to go through to change from 24-7 sump to water change and back uh, is, is not as complex as what I have to go through. Um, and if you come up with a solution or an idea, my goodness, I'd love to hear it. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, I am working on the next one, uh, and I'm starting with the availability videos on, on species that will be uh, ready to go here pretty soon, and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Take care.